The following reading from A Treatise on Indwelling Sin by John Owen is chapter 12. How Sin is Conceived The conception of sin through its deceit and what it consists, the consent of the will to sin, the nature of this, ways and means in which it is obtained. The third success of the deceit of sin in its progressive work is a conception of actual sin. When it has drawn the mind off from its duty and entangled the affections, it proceeds to conceive sin in order to the bringing of it forth. Then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. Now the conception of sin in order to its perpetration, can be nothing but the consent of the will. For as without the consent of the will, sin cannot be committed. So where the will has consented to it, there is nothing in the soul to hinder its actual accomplishment. God does indeed by various ways and means frustrate the bringing forth of these adulterate conceptions, causing them to melt away in the womb or one way or other prove abortive, so that not the least part of that sin is committed which is willed or conceived. Yet there is nothing in the soul itself that remains to give check to it, once the will is given its consent. Oftentimes when a cloud is full of rain and ready to fall, a wind comes and drives it away, and when the will is ready to bring forth its sin, God diverts it by one wind or other. But yet the cloud was as full of rain as if it had fallen, and the soul as full of sin as if it had been committed. This conceiving of lust or sin, then, is its prevalency in obtaining the consent of the will to its solicitations. And by this the soul is deflowered of its chastity towards God and Christ, as the Apostle intimates. Second Corinthians 11, 2 and 3 To clear up this matter, we must observe first that the will is a principle, the next seed and cause of obedience and disobedience. Moral actions are to us or in us so far good or evil as they partake of the consent of the will. Every sin is so voluntary that if it be not voluntary, it is not sin. It is most true of actual sins. The formality of their iniquity arises from the acts of the will in them and concerning them. I mean... As to the persons that commit them, otherwise in itself the formal reason of sin is its aberration from the law of God. Number two. There is a twofold consent of the will to sin. That which is full, absolute, complete, and upon deliberation of prevailing consent, the convictions of the mind being conquered, and no principle of grace in the will to weaken it. With this consent, the soul goes into sin, as a ship before the wind with all its sails displayed, without any check or stop. It rushes into sin like the horse into the battle. Men by this, as the apostle speaks, giving themselves over to sin with greediness, Ephesians 4.19. So Ahab's will was in the murdering of Naboth. He did it upon deliberation, by contrivance, with a full consent. The doing of it gave him such satisfaction as that it cured his malady or the distemper of his mind. This is that consent of the will which is acted in the finishing and completing of sin in unregenerate persons and is not required to the single bringing forth of sin of which we speak. Number two, there is a consent of the will which is attended with the secret retinency and volition of the contrary. So Peter's will was in the denying of his master. His will was in it, or he had not done it. It was a voluntary action, that which he chose to do at the season. Sin had not been brought forth if it had not been thus conceived. But yet at this very time there was resident in the will a contrary principle of love to Christ, yea, in faith in him which utterly did not fail. The efficacy of it was intercepted, and its operation suspended actually through the violent urging of the temptation that he was under. But yet it was in his will and weakened his consent to sin. Though it consented, it was not done with self-pleasing, which such full acts of the will produce. Number three. 
Although there may be a predominant consent in the will, which may suffice for the conception of particular sins, yet there cannot be an absolute, total, full consent of the will of a believer to any sin. For there is in his will a principle fixed on good, on all good, Romans 7.21, he would do good. The principle of grace in the will inclines him to all good. And this in general is prevalent against the principle of sin, so that the will is denominated from this. Grace has a rule and dominion, and not sin, in the will of every believer. Now that consent to sin in the will, which is contrary to the inclination, and generally prevailing principle in the same will, is not, nor cannot be, total, absolute, and complete. Number two. There is not only a general, ruling, prevailing principle in the will against sin, but there is also a secret reluctancy in it against its own act in consenting to sin. It is true the soul is not sensible sometimes of this reluctancy, because the present consent carries away the prevailing act of the will, and takes away the sense of the lusting of the spirit, or reluctancy of the principle of grace in the will. But the general rule holds in all things at all times, Galatians 5.17. The spirit lusteth against the flesh. It does so actually, though not always to the same degree, nor with the same success. And the prevalency of the contrary principle in this or that particular act does not disprove it. It is so on the other side. There is no acting of grace in a will, but sin lusts against it although that lusting be not made sensible in the soul, because of the prevalency of the contrary acting of grace, yet it is enough to keep those actings from perfection in their kind. So is it in this retinency of grace against the acting of sin in the soul, though it be not sensible in its operations, yet it is enough to keep the act from being full and complete. And much of spiritual wisdom lies in discerning a right between the spiritual retinency of the principle of grace and the will against sin, and the rebukes that are given the soul by conscience upon conviction for sin. Number four. Observe that reiterated, repeated acts of the consent of the will to sin may beget a disposition, an inclination in it, to the like acts that may bring the will to a proneness and readiness to consent to sin upon easy solicitations, which is a condition of soul that is dangerous and greatly to be watched against. Number five. This consent to the will which we have thus described may be considered two ways. First, as it is exercised about the circumstances, causes, means, and inducements to sin. Secondly, as it respects this or that actual sin. In the first sense, there is a virtual consent to the will to sin in every inadvertency to the prevention of it. In every neglect of duty that makes way for it. In every hearkening to any temptation leading towards it. In a word, in all the diversions of the mind from its duty. and entanglements of the affections by sin before mentioned. For where there is no act of the will, formally or virtually, there is no sin. But this is not that which we now speak of. But in particular, the consent of the will to this or that actual sin, so far as that either sin is committed, or is prevented by other ways and means not of our present consideration, and in this consists the conceiving of sin, these things being supposed, that which in the next place we are to consider is the way that the deceit of sin proceeds in to procure the consent of the will and so to conceive actual sin in the soul. To this purpose observe, 1. That the will is a rational appetite. Rational is guided by the mind and an appetite is excited by the affections. And so in its operation or actings has respect to both, is influenced by both. Number two, it chooses nothing, consents to nothing, 
but as it has an appearance of good, some present good, it cannot consent to anything under the notion or apprehension of its being evil in any kind. Good is its natural and necessary object, and therefore whatever is proposed to it for its consent must be proposed under an appearance of being either good in itself or good at present to the soul, or good so circumstantiate as it is. So that, number three, we may see hence the reason why the conception of sin is here placed, as a consequence of the minds being drawn away and the affections being entangled. Both these have an influence into the consent of the will, and the conception of this or that actual sin by it. Our way, therefore, here is made somewhat plain. We have seen at large how the mind is drawn away by the deceit of sin, and how the affections are entangled, that which remains is but the proper effect of these things. For the discovery of this, we must instance in some of the special deceits, corrupt and fallacious reasonings before mentioned, and then show their prevalency on the will to a consent to sin. The will is imposed upon by that corrupt reasoning, that grace is exalted in a pardon, and that mercy is provided for sinners. This first, as has been shown, deceives the mind, and that opens a way to the will's consent by removing a sight of evil, which the will has an aversion to. And this in carnal hearts prevails so far as to make them think that their liberty consists in being servants of corruption. Second Peter 2.19 And the poison of it does oftentimes taint and vitiate the minds of believers themselves. So we are so cautioned against it in the scripture. To what therefore has been spoken before, to the use and abuse of the doctrine of the grace of the gospel, we shall add some few other considerations, and fix upon one place of scripture that will give light to it. There is a twofold mystery of grace, of walking with God and of coming to God, and the great design of sin is to change the doctrine and mystery of grace in reference to these things, and that by applying those considerations to the one which are proper to the other, whereby each part is hindered and the influence of the doctrine of grace into them for their furtherance defeated. See First John 2, verses 1 and 2. These things write I unto you that you don't sin. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Here is the whole design and use of the gospel briefly expressed. These things, he says, I write to you. What things were these? Those mentioned in chapter 1, verse 2. The life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested to us. That is, the things concerning the person and mediation of Christ. In verse 7, that pardon, forgiveness, and expiation from sin is to be attained by the blood of Christ. But to what end and purpose does he write these things to them? What do they teach? What do they tend to? A universal abstinence from sin. I write to you, he says, that you don't sin. This is a proper, only genuine end of the doctrine of the gospel. But to abstain from all sin is not our condition in this world, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. What then shall be done in this case? In supposition of sin that we have sinned, is there no relief provided for our souls and consciences in the gospel? Yes, he says. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is a propitiation for our sins. There is full relief in the propitiation and intercession of Christ for us. This is the order and method of the doctrine of the gospel and of the application of it to our own souls. First, to keep us from sin, and then to relieve us against sin. But here enters the deceit of sin and puts this new wine into old bottles in which the bottles are broken and the wine perishes. As to our benefit by it, it changes this method in order of the application of gospel truths. It takes up the last first and that excludes the use of the first utterly. If any man sin, there is pardon provided. Is all the gospel that sin would willingly allow to abide on the minds of men? When we come to God by believing, it would be pressing the former part of being free from sin when the gospel proposes the latter principally or the pardon of sin for our encouragement. 
When we are come to God and should walk with him, it will have only the latter proposed that there is pardon of sin. When the gospel principally proposes a former of keeping ourselves from sin, the grace of God bringing salvation, having appeared to us to that end and purpose. Now the mind being entangled with this deceit, drawn off from its watch by it, diverted from the true ends of the gospel, does several ways impose upon the will to obtain its consent. First, by a sudden surprisal in a case of temptation. Temptation is a representation of a thing, as a present good, a particular good, which is a real evil, a general evil. Now when a temptation armed with opportunity and provocation befalls the soul, the principle of grace and the will rises up with a rejection and detestation of it. But on a sudden, the mind being deceived by sin, breaks in upon the will with a corrupt, fallacious reasoning from gospel grace and mercy, which first staggers and abates the will's opposition, and then causes it to cast a scale by its consent to the side of temptation, presenting evil as a present good, and sin in the sight of God is conceived, though it be never committed. So is the seed of God sacrificed to Moloch, and the weapons of Christ abused to the service of the devil. Number two, it does it insensibly. It insinuates the poison of this corrupt reasoning by little and little until it is greatly prevailed. And as the whole effect of the doctrine of the gospel and holiness and obedience consists in the souls being cast into the frame and mold of it. Romans 6.17 So the whole of the apostasy from the gospel is principally the casting of the soul into the mold of this false reasoning. That sin may be indulged to upon the account of grace and pardon. By this is the soul gratified in sloth and negligence, and taken off from its care as to its particular duties and avoidance of particular sins. It works the soul insensibly off from the mystery of the law of grace, to look for salvation as if we had never performed any duty, being, after we have done all, unprofitable servants, with the resting on sovereign mercy through the blood of Christ and who attend to duties with all diligence as if we look for no mercy, that is, with no less care, though with much liberty and freedom. This the deceitfulness of sin endeavors by all means to work the soul from, and by this debauches the will when its consent is required to particular sins. Number two. The deceived mind imposes on the will to obtain its consent to sin by proposing to it the advantages that may accrue and arise by it, which is one medium in which itself also is drawn away. It renders that which is absolutely evil a present appearing good. So was it with Eve in Genesis 3, laying aside all considerations of the law, Covenant and threats of God, she all at once reflects upon the advantages, pleasures, and benefits which she should obtain by her sin, and reckons them up to solicit the consent of her will. It is, she says, good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and to be desired to make one wise. What should she do, then, but eat it? Her will consented, and she did so accordingly. Pleas for obedience are laid out of the way, and only the pleasures of sin are taken under consideration. So saith Ahab in First Kings 21, Naboth's vineyard is near my house, and I may make it a garden of herbs, therefore I must have it. These considerations a deceived mind imposed on his will until it made him obstinate in the pursuit of his covetousness, through perjury and murder, to the utter ruin of himself and his family. So is the guilt and tendency of sin hid under the covert of advantages and pleasures, and so is conceived or resolved on in the soul. Is the mind being withdrawn, so the affections being enticed and entangled greatly further the conception of sin in the soul by the consent of the will. And they do it two ways. First, by some hasty impulse and surprisal, being themselves stirred up, incited, and drawn forth by some violent provocation or suitable temptation. They put the whole soul, as it were, into a combustion and draw the will into a consent to what they are provoked to and entangled with. 
So was the case of David in the manner of Nabal. A violent provocation from the extreme, unworthy carriage of that foolish churl stirs him up to wrath and revenge. 1 Samuel 25:13. He resolves upon it to destroy a whole family, the innocent with the guilty, verses 33 and 34. Self-revenge and murder were for the season conceived, resolved, consented to, till God graciously took him off his entangled, provoked affection, surprised his will to consent to the conception of many bloody sins. The case was the same with Esau in his anger when he smote the prophet and with Peter in his fear when he denied his master. Let that soul which would take heed of conceiving sin take heed of entangled affections. For sin may be suddenly conceived, the prevalent consent of the will may be suddenly obtained, which give the soul a fixed guilt, though the sin itself be never actually brought forth. Number two. Enticed affections procure the consent of the will by frequent solicitations in which they get ground insensibly upon it and enthrone themselves. Take an instance in the sons of Jacob in Genesis 37.4. They hate their brother because their father loved him. Their affections being enticed, many new occasions fall out to entangle them further as his dreams and the like. This lay rankling in their hearts and never cease soliciting their wills until they resolved upon his death. The unlawfulness, the unnaturalness of the action, the grief of their aged father, the guilt of their own souls are all laid aside. That hatred and envy that they had conceived against him ceased not until they had gotten the consent of their wills to his ruin. This gradual progress of the prevalency of corrupt affections to solicit the soul to sin the wise man excellently describes in Proverbs twenty three thirty one to 35 And this is the common way of sin's procedure in the destruction of souls, which seem to have made some good engagements in the ways of God. When it has entangled them with one temptation and brought the will to some liking of it, there presently becomes another temptation, either to the neglect of some duty or to the refusal of more light. And commonly that in which men fall off utterly from God is not that in which they are first entangled. And this may briefly suffice for the third progressive act of the deceit of sin. It obtains the will's consent to its conception. And by this means are multitude of sins conceived in the heart which very little less defile the soul, or cause it to contract very little less guilt than if they were actually committed and to what has been spoken concerning the deceitfulness of indwelling sin in general, which greatly evidences its power and efficacy, I shall add as I close of this discourse one or two particular ways of its deceitful actings consisting in advantages that it makes use of and means of, relieving itself against that disquisition which is made after it by the word and spirit for its ruin. One head only of each sort we shall hear name, number one, it makes great advantage of the darkness of the mind to work out its design and intendments. The shades of a mind totally dark, that is, devoid utterly of saving grace, are the proper working place of sin. So the effects of it are called the works of darkness, Ephesians 5.11. Romans 13.12 is springing from this. Sin works and brings forth by its help. The working of lust under the covert of a dark mind is, as it were, the upper region of hell, for it lies at the next door to it for filth, whore, and confusion. Now there is a partial darkness abiding still in believers. They know but in part, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Though there be in them all a principle of saving light, the day star is risen in their hearts, yet all the shades of darkness are not utterly expelled out of them in this life. And there are two parts, as it were, or principal effects of the remaining darkness that is in believers. First, ignorance. Ignorance, or a lack of knowledge of the will of God. To err, and mistakes positively, taking that for truth which is falsehood, and that for light which is darkness. Now, both of these does the law of sin make great advantage for the exerting of its power in the soul. Is there a remaining ignorance of anything of the will of God? Sin will be sure to make use of it, and improve it to the uttermost. Though Abimelech 
were not a believer, yet he was a person that had a moral integrity with him in his ways and actions. He declares himself to have had so in a solemn appeal to God, the searcher of all hearts, even in that in which he miscarried, Genesis 20, verse 5. But being ignorant that fornication was a sin, or so great a sin as that it became not a morally honest man to defile himself with it, lust hurries him into that intention of evil in reference to Sarah, as we have it there related. God complains that his people perish for lack of knowledge, Hosea 4, 6. Being ignorant of the mind and will of God, they rushed into evil at every command of the law of sin. Be it as to any duty to be performed, or as to any sin to be committed, if there be in it darkness or ignorance of the mind about them, sin will not lose its advantage. Many a man be an ignorant of the duty incumbent on him for the instruction of his family. Casting the whole weight of it upon the public teaching is by the deceitfulness of sin brought into an habitual sloth and negligence of duty. So much ignorance of the will of God and duty, so much advantage is given to the law of sin. And so we may see what is that true knowledge which with God is acceptable. How exactly does many a poor soul who is low as to notional knowledge yet walk with God? It seems they know so much as sin is not on that account much advantage against them, when others, high in their notions, give advantage to their lusts, even by their ignorance, though they don't know it. Number two, error is the worst part or effect of the mind's darkness and gives great advantage to the law of sin. There is indeed ignorance in every error, but there is not error in all ignorance, and so they may be distinguished. I shall need to exemplify this, but with one consideration, and that is of men who, being zealous for some error, seek to suppress and persecute the truth, and dwelling sin desires no greater advantage. How will it every day, every hour, pour forth wrath, revilings, hard speeches, breathe revenge, murder, desolation, under the name, perhaps, of zeal? On this account we may see poor creatures pleasing themselves every day as if they vaunted in their excellency, when they are foaming out their own shame. Under their real darkness and pretended zeal, sin sits securely and fills pulpits, houses, prayers, streets, with his bitter fruits of envy, malice, wrath, hatred, evil surmises, false speakings, as full as they can hold. The common issue with such poor creatures is the holy, blessed, meek spirit of God withdraws from them and leaves them visibly and openly to that evil, forward, wrathful, worldly spirit, which the law of sin has cherished and heightened in them. Sin dwells not anywhere more secure than in such a frame. So I say it lays hold in particular of advantages to practice upon with this deceitfulness, and in this also to exert its power in the soul, in which this single instance of its improving the darkness of the mind to its own ends is a sufficient evidence. Number two, it uses means of relieving itself against a pursuit that is made after it in the heart by the word and spirit of grace. One also of its wiles, in the way of instance, I shall name in this kind, and that is the alleviation of its own guilt. It pleads for itself that it is not so bad, so filthy, so fatal as is pretended. In this course of extenuation it proceeds in two ways. First, absolutely. Many secret pleas it will have that the evil which it tends to is not so pernicious as conscience is persuaded it is. It may be ventured on without ruin. These considerations it will strongly urge when it is at work in a way of surprise, when the soul has no leisure or liberty to weigh its suggestions in the balance of the sanctuary, and not seldom is a will imposed on by this, and advantage is gotten to shift itself from under the sword of the spirit. It is not such, but that it may be let alone or allowed to die of itself, which probably within a while it will do. No need of that violence which in mortification is to be offered, it is time enough to deal with a manner of no greater importance hereafter, with other pleas like those before mentioned. Or number two, comparatively, and this is a large field for its deceit and subtlety to lurk in. Though it is an evil indeed to be relinquished, and the soul is to be made watchful against it, yet it is not of that magnitude and degree as we may see in the lives of others, even saints of God, much less such as some saints of old have fallen into, by these and the light pretenses, I say, it seeks to evade and keeps its abode in the soul when pursued to destruction. 
and how little a portion of its deceitfulness is it that we have declared. The end of chapter 12 of A Treatise of Indwelling Sin. This entire book has been narrated and is available. This is a continuation of Thomas Ridgely's exposition of the larger catechism on assurance of salvation. What are those marks by which a person may safely conclude himself to be in a state of grace? In order to our determining this manner, we must consider what are the true and genuine effects of faith, which we find mentioned in Scripture, namely those other graces that accompany or flow from it, as when it is said to work by love, Galatians 5, verse 6, or as we are hereby enabled to overcome the world, 1 John 5, verse 4, or to despise the honors, riches, and pleasures thereof, especially when standing in competition with Christ, or our hearts are thereby drawn aside from him. This effect is produced in Moses when he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Hebrews 11.24-26 And in others who confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth, verses 13 and 16, who desired a better country, that is, in heavenly, whose conversation was in heaven, Philippians 3, verse 10. Also we are to inquire whether it has a tendency to purify the heart, Acts 15, verse 9, and so puts us upon abhorring, flying from, watching, and striving against everything that tends to corrupt and defile the soul and whether it tends to excite us to universal obedience, which is called the obedience of faith. Romans 16.26 And a carefulness to maintain good works. Titus 3, verse 6 Which proceed from and are evidences of the truth of it. As the Apostle says, Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. James 2, verse 18 or, as our Savior says, a tree is known by his fruit. But that we may more particularly judge of the truth of grace by the marks and evidences thereof, we must consider its beginning and progress, or with what frame of spirit we first embraced and closed with Christ, and what our conversation has been since that time. Number one. As to the former of these, that is, our judging of the truth of grace by the first beginning of it. Here we are to inquire what were the motives and inducements that inclined us to accept of Christ. Did we first see ourselves lost and undone, as sinful fallen creatures, and were we determined hereupon to have recourse to him for salvation, as the only refuge we could betake ourselves to? Did we first consider ourselves as guilty, and did this guilt set very uneasy upon us? And in order to the removal of it, did we betake ourselves to Christ for forgiveness? Did we consider ourselves as weak and unable to do what is good, and so apply ourselves to him for strength against indwelling sin and victory over the temptations which prevailed against us? Also let us inquire whether it was only a slavish fear and dread of the wrath of God and the punishment of sin and hell that gave the first turn to our thoughts and affections so as to put us on altering our course of life, or whether besides this we saw the evil of sin arising from its intrinsic nature and its opposition to the holiness of God, and was this attended with shame and self-abhorrence. And at the same time, did we see the excellency and loveliness of Christ? Was he precious to us as he is to them that believe? 1 Peter 2, verse 7. Again, let us further inquire, what were the workings of our spirits when we first closed with Christ? Did we do this with judgment, duly weighing what he demands of us in a way of duty, as well as what we are encouraged to expect from him? Were we made willing to accept of him in all his offices, and to have respect to all his commandments? Were we earnestly desirous to have communion with him here, as well as to be glorified with him hereafter? Were we content to submit to the cross of Christ, to bear his reproach, and account as preferable to all the glories of the world? 
were we willing to be conformed to an humbled, suffering Jesus, and to take our lot with his servants, though they may be reckoned a refuse and offscouring of all things? And let us further inquire whether we did this with reliance on his assistance as being sensible of the treachery and deceitfulness of our own hearts, and our utter inability to do what is good without the aids of his grace. Did we accordingly give up ourselves to him in hope of obtaining help from him, in order to the right discharge of every duty? Did we reckon ourselves nothing in Christ to be all in all, that all our springs are in him? This is a good beginning of the work of grace, which will prepare the way for this grace of assurance, which we are now considering. Objection. Some will object against what has been said concerning our inquiring into, or being able to discern the first acts of faith, or that frame of spirit wherewith we then closed with Christ, that they knew not the time of their conversion. If ever they were converted, they cannot remember or determine what was the particular ordinance or providence that gave them the first conviction of sin, and of their need of Christ, and induced them to close with him, much less can they tell what were the workings of their hearts at such a time. It is impossible for them to trace the footsteps of providence so as to point out the way and manner in which this work was at first begun in their souls. This, therefore, is not to be laid down as a mark or evidence of grace, which so few can make use of. Answer. I am not insensible that this is the case of the greatest number of believers. There are very few who, like the Apostle Paul, can tell the time and place of their conversion and every circumstance leading to it, or like those converts who, when the gospel was first preached by Peter, were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2.37 or like the jailer who broke forth into an affectionate inquiry not much unlike to it. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Chapter 16, verse 30, though the ordinance leading to it was of a different nature. Sometimes the way of the Spirit of God in the soul at first is so discernible that it cannot but be observed by them who are brought into a state of grace, but others know nothing of this especially they who have not run into all excess of riot and been stopped in the course on a sudden by the grace of God in whom the change made in conversion was real, though it could not from the nature of the things be so plainly discerned in all the circumstances. Some have been regenerate from the womb, others have had a greater degree of restraining grace, and been trained up in the knowledge of the doctrines of the gospel from their very childhood, and retained the impressions of our religious education. These cannot so easily discern the first beginnings of the work of grace in their souls, yet they may and ought to inquire whether ever they found in the course of their lives such a frame of spirit as has been before described, which believers have when the work of grace has first begun, and it is not very material for them to be able to discern whether these were the first actings of grace or not. The main thing to be determined is whether they have ground to conclude that ever they experience the grace of God and truth. In this case, the most that some can say concerning themselves is as the blind man says in the gospel when the Pharisees were inquisitive about the restoring his sight and the way and manner in which this was done, this is all that I know concerning myself that whereas I was blind, now I see. John 9, verse 25 so the true convert says, Whereas I was once dead in trespasses and sins, I am now alive and enabled to put forth living and spiritual actions to the glory of God. This evidence will give as much ground to conclude that they are in a state of grace as though they were able to determine when they were first brought into it. Number two, we may judge of the truth of grace by the method in which it has been carried on, whether we are able to determine the way and manner in which it was first begun or not, as a further evidence of the truth of it. Sanctification is a progressive work. Therefore, it is not enough for us to set our faces heavenward, but we must make advances towards it and be found in the daily exercise of grace in order to our concluding that we are in a state of grace. A believer must not only set out in the right way, but he must hold on therein. He must live by faith if he would conclude that the work of faith has begun in truth. It is not sufficient to call upon God, 
or implore help from him, when under some distressing providences and afterwards to grow remiss in, or lay aside this duty, but it must be our constant work. A true Christian is distinguished from an hypocrite, in that it is said concerning the latter, will he delight himself in the Almighty, will he always call upon God. Job 27, verse 20, denoting that a true believer will do so. He is either habitually or actually inclined to it, and that in such a way as is attended with the daily exercise of those graces which are the fruits and effects of faith, whereby he may conclude that he is in a state of grace. Thus far we have considered those marks or evidences of grace which, in order to our attaining assurance, we must be able to discern in ourselves. But inasmuch as a believer may understand what are the marks of grace contained in Scripture, and at the same time inquire into the state of his soul, to know whether he can apprehend in himself any evidence of the truth of grace, and not be able to arrive to a satisfaction as to this manner, so as to have his doubts and fears removed, let it be considered, number three, that he must depend on, hope and pray for the testimony of the Spirit, with his Spirit, that he is a child of God. It will be a difficult matter for us to conclude that we have the truth of grace till the Spirit is pleased to shine on his work, which when he does, all things will appear clear and bright to us, though before this we might walk in darkness and have no light. In speaking concerning the inward testimony of the Spirit, which is necessary to enable a believer to discern in himself the marks of grace, on which his assurance of salvation is founded, let it be premised that as it is a branch of the Spirit's divine glory, by his internal influence to deal with the hearts of his people, so he does this various ways according to the various faculties of the soul, which are the subjects thereof particularly when by his power he renews the will and causes it to act those graces which are the effects of his divine power. Then he is said to sanctify a believer. But when he deals with the understanding and conscience, enabling us to discern the truth of the work of grace, that we may take the comfort of it, then he is described in Scripture as a witness hereunto, or as witnessing with our spirits that we are in a state of grace the consequence of which is that the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, we may know what is the hope of his calling, Ephesians 1, verse 18. Accordingly, he gives us to discern that he has called us by his grace, and as a result of it, granted us a hope of eternal life. This is a privilege plainly mentioned in Scripture, and we must not suppose that none had it but those who had extraordinary revelation, since it is so necessary to a believer's attaining that peace and joy which the church in this present dispensation is certainly not less possessed of than it was in former ages. And that the Spirit gives his testimony to the work of grace in the souls of believers, though extraordinary revelation be ceased, is evident from what is matter of daily experience, since there are many instances of those who have used their utmost endeavors in examining themselves to know whether they had any marks of grace, who have not been able to discern any, though they have been thought to be sincere believers by others, till on a sudden light has broke forth out of darkness, and their evidences for eternal life cleared up, so that all their doubts have been removed. And this they could not but attribute to a divine hand, and as much as before this they could meditate nothing but terror to themselves. And in this case, what the apostle prays for with respect to the church that the God of hope would fill them with all joy and peace in believing, that they might abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Romans 15.13 is experienced by them, and on this account they are said to be sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 1.13, in which their hope is established, and that is now confirmed to them by this means, which they were before in perplexity about, so that we have as much ground to conclude that the Spirit is the author of assurance in believers as we have that he is the author of sanctification. But that this doctrine may not appear liable to the charge of enthusiasm, let it be further considered that the Spirit never gives his testimony to the truth of grace in any in whom he has not first wrought it. For that would be, as it were, a setting his seal to a blank. 
And to this we may add that he, at the same time, excites a lively exercise of grace in which they are enabled to discern that it is true and genuine, so that their assurance, though it be not without some internal impressive influences which they are favored with, yet it is not wholly dependent on them. Therefore, if you demand a reason of the hope that is in them, though they ascribe the glory hereof to the Holy Spirit as enabling them to discern the truth of grace, yet they are able to prove their own selves, after having examined themselves, whether they are in the faith, by discovering their evidences of the faith of God's elect, which argue is that their assurance is no delusion. An exposition of the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 81, are all true believers at all times assured of their present being in a state of grace and that they shall be saved? Answer. Assurance of grace and salvation, not being of the essence of faith, true believers may wait long before they obtain it, and after the enjoyment of it, may have it weakened and intermitted through manifold distempers, sins, temptations, and desertions, yet are they never left without such a presence and support of the Spirit of God as keeps them from sinking into utter despair. Having considered some believers as favored with assurance of their being in the state of grace, we are in this answer led to speak of others who are destitute of it, and the general method in which it may be considered is... First, that there is something supposed, namely that the assurance of grace and salvation is not of the essence of saving faith. Number two, some things are inferred from this supposition, namely, that true believers may wait long before they obtain assurance, and two, that after the enjoyment thereof it may be weakened and intermitted. The reasons whereof are a sign, namely bodily distempers, sins, temptations, and divine desertions, Yet it is further added that they are never left without the support of the Spirit of God, in which they are kept from sinking into utter despair. As to the thing supposed in this answer, namely, that assurance of grace and salvation is not of the essence of faith, there are many who, in other respects, explain the nature of faith in such a way as is unexceptionable, who, notwithstanding, assert that assurances of the essence thereof, in which we cannot but think they express themselves very unwarily, at least, they ought to have more clearly discovered what they mean by faith, and what by assurance, being of the essence of faith. If they mean that no one has saving faith but he who has an assurance of his own salvation, they not only assert what is contrary to the experience of many believers, but lay a stumbling block in the way of weak Christians who will be induced from hence to conclude that because they cannot tell whether they are true believers or not, therefore they are destitute of saving faith, upon which account it is necessary for us to inquire how far this supposition is to be allowed of and in what respect denied. It is certain that there are many excellent divines in our own and foreign nations who have defined faith by assurance, which they have supposed so essential to it, that without it no one can be reckoned a believer. It may be they might be inclined thus to express themselves by the sense in which they understood several texts of Scripture, in which assurance seems to be considered as a necessary ingredient in faith. As it is said, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, Hebrews 10.22. And when the apostle speaks of assurance as a privilege that belonged to the church to which he wrote, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, an house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. And elsewhere, he so far blames their not knowing themselves or being destitute of this assurance, though he will hardly allow them to have any faith who were without it. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates, chapter 13, verse 5. From such like expressions as these, they who plead for assurance, being of the essence of faith, are ready to conclude that they who are destitute of it can hardly be called believers. But that this manner may be said in a true light, we must distinguish between assurance of the object, namely the great and important doctrines of the gospel being of the essence of faith, and assurance of our interest in Christ being so. The former of these we will not deny, for no one can come to Christ who is not assured that he will receive him, nor trust in him till he is fully assured that he is able to save him. 
But the latter we must take leave to deny, for if no one is a believer but he that knows himself to be so, then he that doubts of his salvation must be concluded to be no believer, which is certainly a very discouraging doctrine to weak Christians. And also when we lose the comfortable persuasion we once had of our interest in Christ, we are bound to question all our former experiences and to determine ourselves to be in a state of unregeneracy, which is, in effect, to deny to give God the glory of that powerful work which was formerly wrought in us, which we then thought to be a work of grace. If they indeed mean by assurance being of the essence of faith, and an assurance of our interest in Christ is essential to the highest or most comfortable acts of faith, designing thereby to put us upon pressing after it, if we have not attained to it, and that by this God is very much glorified, and a foundation laid for our offering praise to Him for the experience we have had of His grace, which a doubting Christian cannot be said to do, we have nothing to say against it. Or if they should assert that doubting is no ingredient in faith, nor a commendable excellency in a Christian, this we do not deny. All that we are contending for is that there may be a direct act of faith, or a faith of reliance in those who are destitute of assurance that they are in a state of grace, which is a thing supposed in this answer when it is said that assurance is not of the essence of faith that this may be better understood and we be led into the sense of those scriptures that describe believers as having assurance, such as those but now mentioned and others to the like purpose, let it be considered that there are many scriptures in which believers are said to have such an assurance as only respects the objects of faith, namely the person, offices, and glory of Christ, the truth of the gospel, and the promises thereof, which we do not deny to be of the essence of faith. Thus, when the Apostle prays for the church, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit, knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, Colossians 2, verse 2, and when elsewhere he says, Our gospel came to you in much assurance, 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, and when he exhorts persons to draw near to God with a true heart and full assurance of faith, Hebrews 10, 22, it is probable that he means in these and several other scriptures of the like import no more than an assurance of the object of faith. And as for that scripture but now mentioned in 2 Corinthians 13.5, where he seems to assert that all who are destitute of this privilege are reprobates, some understand the word which we translate reprobates as only signifying injudicious Christians, and if so, this is not inconsistent with the character of believers but others with an equal degree of probability render it disapproved. And so the meaning is that if you know not your own selves, to wit that Christ is in you, you are greatly to be blamed or disapproved, especially because this proceeds from your neglect of the duty of self-examination, by which means you have no proof of Christ's being in you, who are so ready to demand a proof of his speaking in ministers, as in verse 3. Therefore it does not appear from this text, that everyone who endeavors to know that he is in a state of grace, by diligent self-examination, but cannot conclude that he is so, must be determined to be destitute of faith, which would necessarily follow from our asserting that assurance of our interest in Christ is of the essence of saving faith. There are other scriptures which speak of assurance as the distinguishing character of Christians in general, which are usually brought to prove that our assurance is of the essence of faith, namely, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are of God, and in several places in the New Testament, in which the Apostle addresses his discourse to whole churches as having assurance, as well as the grace of faith. Thus the Apostle Peter, 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9, speaks of them as loving Christ, believing in Him, rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory, and receiving the end of their faith, even the salvation of their souls, which could hardly be said of them if they were destitute of assurance of their own salvation. All that I would infer from these and such like scriptures is that it seems probable that assurance was a privilege more commonly experienced in that age of the church than it is in our day, and there may be two reasons assigned for this, number one, because the change that passed upon them, 
when they were converted, was so apparent that it was hardly possible for it not to be discerned. They turned from dead idols and the practice of the vilest abominations to serve the living God, which two extremes are so opposite that their being brought from one to the other could not but be remarked by and consequently more visible to themselves than if it had been otherwise. But number two, that which may be assigned as the principal reason of this is, because the church was called at this time to bear a public testimony to the gospel by enduring persecutions of various kinds, and some of them were to resist unto blood. Therefore, that God might prepare them for their sufferings, and that he might encourage others to embrace the faith of the gospel, which was then in its infant state, he was pleased to favor them with this great privilege. And it may be hereafter, if God should call the church to endure like trials, he may in mercy grant them a greater degree of assurance than is ordinarily experienced. Nevertheless, it may be questioned whether those scriptures which speak of assurance as though it were a privilege common to the whole church, are not to be understood as applicable to the greater part of them, rather than to every individual believer among them. For though the apostle in one of the scriptures before mentioned considers the church at Corinth as enjoying this privilege, and concluding that it should go well with them in another world, when this earthly tabernacle was dissolved, yet he speaks of some of them in the same epistle as knowing their own selves, how that Jesus Christ was in them. And the Apostle John, notwithstanding what he says to the church, we know that we are of God in 1 John 5.19, which argues that many of them had assurance plainly intimates that all of them had it not, from what he says in verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. And though in another scripture, but now mentioned, the Apostle Peter speaks to the church to which he writes, as having joy unspeakable and full of glory, consequent upon their faith, which argues that they had assurance, yet he exhorts others of them to give diligence to make their calling and election sure, Second Peter 1.10. These, therefore, are supposed at that time not to have it from all which it may be concluded that assurance of grace and salvation is not of the essence of saving faith, which is the thing supposed in this answer. Number two. We proceed to consider those things that are inferred from this supposition, namely, first, that a believer may wait long before he attains it. This appears from what is matter of daily experience and observation. The sovereignty of God discovers itself in this as much as it does when he makes the ordinances effectual to salvation and giving converting grace to those who attend upon them. Some are called early to be made partakers of that salvation that is in Christ, others late. The same may be said with respect to God's given assurance. Some are favored with this privilege soon after, or when first they believe, Others are like those whom the Apostle speaks of, who through fear of death are all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hebrews 2, verse 15. Many have often inquired into the state of their souls that cannot discern any marks or evidences of grace in themselves, whose conversation is such that others cannot but conclude them to be true believers. Their spirits are depressed, doubts and fears prevail, and tend to make their lives very uncomfortable. They wait and pray for the evidence and sense of God's love to them, but cannot immediately find it. This the psalmist speaks of, either in his own person, or thereby represents the case of many who had the truth of grace, but not the assurance of it. When he says, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer your terrors, I am distracted, Psalm 88, compared with the 15th Psalm. God suffers it to be thus with them for wise ends. Hereby he lets them know that assurance of his love is a special gift and work of the Spirit, without which they remain destitute of it, and cannot take comfort, either from their former or present experiences. Number two. They who once enjoyed assurance may have it weakened and intermitted, 
whether it may be entirely lost will be considered under a following head when we speak concerning the supports that believers have and how far they are kept by this from sinking into utter despair. It is one thing to fall from the truth of grace, another thing to lose a comfortable sense of it. The joy of faith may be suspended when the acts and habits of faith remain firm and unshaken. The brightest morning may afterwards be followed with clouds and tempests. Even so, our clearest discoveries of our interest and the love of God may be followed with the withdrawment of the light of His countenance, and we be left under many discouraging circumstances concerning our state, having lost the assurance we once had. If it be inquired what reason may be assigned for this, I answer that it must in a great measure be resolved into the sovereignty of God, who will bring his people which way he pleases to heaven, and may take those comforts which had their first rise from himself, and at the same time none must say, Why are you doing this? However, we may observe some particular reasons which the providence of God points out to us, to which we may in other respects ascribe our lack of assurance, and these may be reduced to four heads, particularly mentioned in this answer, number one. It is sometimes occasioned by manifold distempers or bodily diseases. The soul and body are so closely joined and dependent on each other that the one can hardly suffer without the other. Hence it is that bodily distempers affect the mind excite and give disturbance to the passions, which is a great addition to the uneasiness that ensues hereupon. When the spirits are deepest, and we are under the prevalency of a melancholy disposition, we are oftentimes inclined to think that we are not in a state of grace. And though we were before this disposed to comfort other in like cases, we are at this time unable to take the least encouragement ourselves. All things look black and dismal. Our former hope is reckoned no other than delusive, and we brought to the very brink of despair. And it may be observed that these sad and melancholy apprehensions concerning our state increase or abate as the distemper that gives occasion to it more or less prevails. Now, that we may be able to determine whether our lack of assurance proceeds from some natural cause or bodily distemper, we must inquire whether before this we have endeavored to walk in all good conscience in the sight of God, to hate every false way, and make religion the great business of life so that we cannot assign any reigning sin as the cause of our present desponding frame, and also whether we have been diligent in performing the duty of self-examination, and have been sensible that we stood in need of the Spirit's witness with ours, in order to our arriving to a comfortable persuasion that we are in a state of grace. And if, as a result of these inquiries, we cannot see any cause leading to this dejection of spirit, but the unavoidable infirmities which we are daily liable to, then we may probably conclude that it arises from a distemper of body, and in order to our determining this matter, we must further inquire whether some afflictive providence has not had an influence upon us to bring us into a melancholy temper, and whether this does not appear in what relates to our secular as well as our spiritual concerns. And if this be the case, though it be very afflictive, it is not attended with that guilt as it would be had it been occasioned by some presumptuous sin. And there are other medicines to be used when it arises from this cause, besides those which are of a spiritual nature, that are contained in the gospel. But what they are, it is not our business in this place to determine. Number two, there are many sins which are the occasion of a person's being destitute of assurance. As all the troubles of life are brought upon us by sin, so are all our doubts and fears arising from the lack of a comfortable sense of or interest in the love of God. It pleases God in the method of his providence thus to deal with his people that we may humble them for presumptuous sins, more especially those that are committed against light and conviction of conscience, that he may bring to remembrance their sins of omission or neglect to exercise those graces in which the life of faith consists, that by this they may feel the effect of their stupidity indifferency, and carnal security, or their engaging in religious duties in their own strength, without dependence on the spirit and grace of God, or a due sense of their inability to perform any duty in a right way, 
or sometimes, as has been before observed, they lack assurance because they do not examine themselves, which is God's ordinance for the attaining this privilege. Or if they do, they neglect to give that glory to the Holy Spirit which is due to Him by depending on His enlightening influence in which they may arrive to a comfortable persuasion of their interest in Christ. Number three, assurance is oftentimes weakened and intermitted through manifold temptations. Satan is very active in this manner and shows his enmity against the interest of Christ and the souls of his people as much as lies in his power, with this intent that though it is impossible for him to ruin the soul by rooting out that grace that is implanted in it, yet he may disturb its peace and weaken its assurance, and if not prevented, hurry it into despair. In this case, the general design of his temptations is to represent God as a sin-revenging judge, a consuming fire, and to present to our view the threatenings in which his wrath is revealed against sinners, and to endeavor to set aside the promises of the gospel from which alone relief may be had. Also, he puts us upon considering sin not only as heinously aggravated, which may for the most part be done with justice, but also as altogether unpardonable and at the same time pretends to insinuate to us that we are not elected, or that Christ did not die for us, and therefore what he has done and suffered will not redound to our advantage. Now there is apparently the hand of Satan in this manner, inasmuch as he attempts by false methods of reasoning to persuade us that we are not in a state of grace, or that God is an enemy to us, and therefore our condition is desperate, in which he uses the arts of the old serpent that he may deceive us by drawing conclusions against ourselves from false premises, because we daily experience the internal workings of corrupt nature, which inclines us to many sins, both of omission and commission. Therefore there is no room for us to expect mercy and forgiveness from God and from our barrenness and unprofitableness under the means of grace, our improvements not be in proportion to the obligations we have been laid under, or because we have had great reason to charge ourselves with many declensions and backslidings, which afford matter for deep humiliation, and should put us upon sincere repentance, he endeavors to persuade us that we are altogether destitute of special grace, and whenever we are unprepared or indisposed for the right performance of holy duty, and our affections are not suitably raised, but grow stupid, remiss, and careless therein, he puts us upon concluding that it is a vain thing for us to draw nigh to God, and that he has utterly rejected both our persons and services, or if we are not favored with immediate returns of prayer and sensible communion with God therein, He tempts us to infer that we shall never obtain the blessing we are pressing after, and therefore we may as well lay aside this duty and say, Why should I wait on the Lord any longer? And if by this method he cannot discourage us from engaging in holy duties, he sometimes injects blasphemous thoughts or unbecoming conceptions of the divine majesty, which fills the soul with the greatest grief and uneasiness, that by this he might give us occasion to conclude that we sin in persisting therein. And by all these temptations he endeavors to plunge us into the depths of despair. And as to what concerns the purpose of God relating to the event of things, when we are led to determine that we are not elected, this is alleged without sufficient ground. And therein he deceives us by pursuing the same false methods of reasoning, and puts us upon presuming to enter into those secret things which do not belong to us, because we deserve to be cast off by him for our sins, instead of giving diligence to make our calling and election sure. It is one thing not to be able to conclude that we are elected, and another thing to say that we are not so. The former of these is a consequence of our present doubts and desponding apprehensions concerning our state. The latter is plainly a temptation of Satan. This we are often subject to when we have lost that assurance of our interest in Christ that we once enjoyed. Number four. A believer's lack of assurance is, for the most part, attended with and arises from divine desertion. Not that we are to suppose that God will cast off his people, whom he has foreknown, effectually called, and preserved hitherto, so as to forsake them utterly, for that is inconsistent with his everlasting love and the promises of the covenant of grace which respect to their salvation. 
But that which we understand by divine desertions is God's withdrawing his comforting presence and withholding the witness of his spirit to the work of grace in the soul. From whence arises those doubts and fears which attend the lack of it. As God says to his people, For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. Isaiah 54, 7 In this respect they are destitute of God's comforting presence, though at the same time they may be favored with his supporting presence, and those powerful influences which are necessary to maintain the work of grace, which at present appears to be very weak and languishing. And this leads us to consider the last thing mentioned in this answer, namely, that though they are thus described, they are not left without such a presence and support of the Spirit of God, as keeps them from sinking into utter despair. This observation ought to be explained and considered with certain limitation, lest, while on the one hand, we assert that which affords matter of encouragement to believers when they have some degree of hope, we should, on the other hand, throw discouragements in the way of others who will be apt to imagine when they are ready to sink into despair, that this is wholly inconsistent with any direct act of faith. I dare not say that no believer was ever so far deserted as to be left to the sphere of his interest in Christ, inasmuch as scripture and daily experience gives us instances of some whose conversation in many respects discovers him to have had the truth of grace, whom God has been pleased for wise ends to leave to the terror of their own thoughts, and they have remained for some time in the depths of despair, and others have gone out of the world under a cloud concerning whom there has been ground to hope their state was safe. Therefore it is somewhat difficult to determine what is meant in this answer by a believer's being kept from sinking into utter despair, if the meaning is that they have the supports of the Spirit of God, so as to be kept from relapsing into a state of unregeneracy and their despairing condition, that may be easily accounted for. Or if we are to understand by it that believers are not generally given up to the greatest degree of despair, especially such as is inconsistent with the exercise of any grace, that is not to be denied. But I would rather say that though a believer may have despairing apprehensions concerning his state, and the guilt of sin lie upon him like a great weight, so as to depress his spirits, yet he shall not sink into endless misery. For though darkness may continue for a night, light and joy shall come in the morning. And accordingly we may consider, number one, that though there are many who are far from having assurance, yet they are sometimes favored with a small glimmering of hope, which keeps them from utter despair. Number two, if they are in deep despair, yet they are not so far left as not to desire grace, though they conclude themselves to be destitute of it, or not to lament the loss of those comforts, and their being unable to exercise those graces which once they thought themselves possessed of. Number three, a believer, when in a despairing way, is notwithstanding enabled by a direct act of faith to give up himself to Christ, though he cannot see his interest in him, and so long for those experiences and comforts which he once enjoyed. And when he is at the worst, he can say with Job, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Job 13, verse 15. Number 4. In this case, a person has generally such a degree of the presence of God as that he is enabled to justify him in all his dealings with him and lay the blame of all the troubles that he is under on himself. And this is attended with shame and confusion of face, self-abhorrence and godly sorrow. Number five, despairing believers have, notwithstanding such a presence of God with them, as keeps them from abandoning his interest, or running with sinners into all excess of riot, which would give occasion to others to conclude that they never had the truth of grace. From what has been said concerning true believers being destitute of assurance, and yet having some degree of the presence of God with them, at the same time we may infer, first, that this is not inconsistent with what has been said concerning a believer's persevering in grace. Yet it must be considered with this limitation, that though the truth of grace shall not be lost, yet the comforts and evidences of it may and often are. 
Secondly, this should put us upon circumspect walking and watchfulness against presumptuous sins, which, as has been before observed, are often the occasion of the loss of assurance, and also on the exercise of a faith of reliance on Christ, for the maintaining the acts of grace as well as restoring the comforts of it. Thirdly, this should instruct believers what to do when destitute of this privilege of assurance, We have observed that this is attended with divine desertion, which is generally occasioned by sins committed. Therefore let us say with Job, Show me wherefore thou contendest with me, chapter 10, verse 2. Let me know what are those secret sins by which I have provoked you to leave me destitute of your comforting presence. Enable me to be affected with humbled for and unfeignedly repent of them and exercise that faith in Christ which may be a means of my recovering that hope or assurance which I am at present destitute of. Fourthly, what has been said concerning the believers being destitute of assurance should put us upon sympathizing with those who are in a despairing way and using endeavors to administer comfort to them rather than censor them or conclude them to be in an unregenerate state as Job's friends did, because the hand of God had touched him, and he was destitute of his comforting presence. Fifthly, from what has been said concerning that degree of the presence of God which believers enjoy, which has a tendency to keep them from utter despair, at least from sinking into perdition, how disconsolate soever their case may be at present, we may be induced to admire the goodness and faithfulness of God in his dealings with his people, who will not lay more on them than he will enable them to bear, though they are comfortless and hopeless, yet they shall not be destroyed, and in the end they shall be satisfied with God's loving kindness, and when the clouds are all dispersed, they shall have a bright and glorious day in his immediate presence, where there is fullness of joy, and at his right hand, where there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16, verse 11. This is a narration from Thomas Ridgely's Body of Divinity, wherein the doctrines of the Christian religion are explained and defended, being the substance of several lectures on the Assembly's larger catechism. This is from the 1815 edition of this work. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.